Hey, Friendly Neighborhood Immunologist here, and today's video is a requested one about Valneva. Valneva is a French company that is making a whole inactivated coronavirus 19 vaccine. Now, they've just completed their phase three clinical trials in about 4,000 people, and in those 4,000 people, there was robust antibody production to a wide variety of targets, including the spike protein and the N protein. So what I'm gonna tell you today is how the researchers created the vaccine, what is in the shot, how it works, and what it has to do with an old world monkey called a gribbit. So let's get started. Valneva is a whole inactivated coronavirus 19 vaccine. And what that means is the researchers grew up the entire coronavirus vaccine, and then they killed it or inactivated it with either heat, acid, or radiation. Valneva is not the first whole inactivated coronavirus vaccine available. India created Covaxin and China has created Sinovac. However, this is the first whole inactivated vaccine available in the UK and most parts of Europe. Uh, so what does it do? They actually use something called Vero cells. And if you're curious as to how Sinovac or Covaxin were created, this video can be used to explain that as well. I'm going to tell you what Vero cells are, but first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about why they're called immortalized cells. They're called immortalized because as long as they're given the nutrients they need, similar nutrients found in your blood and tissue, they can grow forever. You might be familiar with HeLa cells from Henrietta Lacks. Her cells have actually been grown for approximately 70 years at this point. Now, Vero cells actually came from a small old world monkey called a grivet. They're actually from the kidney cells found in a grivet. So an initial grivet was sacrificed, but then the cells were immortalized, meaning this animal was probably killed 20 to 30 years ago. All right, here is the grivet. You can see it right there. And you might be wondering if this is common, and the answer is yes. The creation of the polio vaccine also used primate cells. They actually used a rhesus macaque. For every rhesus macaque used and killed for the vaccine, 65 doses were made, saving the lives of 65 children. And I do talk about this in my immunology class, the ethics about this. So researchers were concerned and their solution was create cell culture. So the researchers immortalized rhesus monkey kidney cells so that after the cell culture was created, no additional rhesus monkeys were killed and it saved thousands of primate lives. All right, so back to Valneva. I'm drawing a little pipette tip here and the researchers are dropping coronavirus 19 on top of a giant vat of Vero cells, those grivet kidney cells. So here we go, adding up some coronavirus and then I'm going to show you in the circle, which is a cell off to the right, this is gonna become a Vero cell. And I will show you what happens if we zoom in on the virus and the Vero cell. And I do want to mention about the Vero cells and the fact that they're immortalized means that they have stem cell-like properties. And I'll talk more about that in my wrap up. So here I'm drawing for you the inner portion of a cell called the nucleus. The nucleus is where your DNA is housed. It's intentionally housed in the middle past another set of barriers to keep it protected. So here the outside ring of the cell is called the cytoplasm. I'm drawing for you now a green receptor outside of the cell. This is actually the door. It's uh, called ACE2 angiotensin 2 receptor. It's found highly in the lungs as well as in your gut. Now, remember, this is the door that the coronavirus spike protein is the key to. So the coronavirus is using the door ACE2 to enter the Vero cell. Now, what it wants to do is find machinery in the Vero cell to make copies of itself. It wants to make copies of its proteins as well as its RNA. And it can do that in the cytoplasm. There we go. So it's actually not ever going to enter the nucleus. It's not ever going to alter the DNA of the Vero cell. Now viruses actually can replicate two ways. Uh, one is a little bit more subtle and the other is rather violent. So the subtle way to make copies of itself is to have them leave just a few at a time. And that's known as viral budding. However, if they all erupt at once, thousands of them erupting at once, it will burst the cell apart in something called viral lysis. All right. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which one happens because the goal of the researchers is to collect the coronavirus 19 
and basically kill it. So how do the researchers do that? How do they collect all of these coronavirus and separate them from the Vero cells? The answer is it's probably a multi-step process, but I will tell you about one of the simplest ways to collect and purify the virus from the Vero cells because there are no Vero cells in the shot. All right, you basically would take the cells and the virus from the vat and you would place them in a tube now the cells are larger and heavier, so if you spin them down in a centrifuge, the cells will go to the bottom and the virus is much smaller. Even if the cells are broken apart, they'll go to the bottom because they're heavier than the coronavirus. The coronavirus will be found very readily in the liquid media at the top of the tube. So the researchers could just remove the top portion where the virus is located and then follow some additional purification steps. There we go centrifugation. Now, after centrifugation comes the step where the researchers will inactivate the virus. Here we go. We're going to collect, and then I'm going to do a quick recap. So step one is grow up the Vero cells and add the coronavirus to the cells. There we go. Step one. Step two, collect and purify through centrifugation and additional methods. Step three, inactivate the virus. This is very important. Uh, they need to inactivate it either through heat. I've actually worked with heat killed bacteria for five years through some type of acid or enzymes, as well as radiation. All right, so what is actually in the shot that you receive? There are no monkey kidney cells in this shot. They are centrifuged and purified out. So what is in the shot? Number one, inactivated whole coronavirus 19. Now I couldn't figure out what the company did, whether or not it was heat, irradiation, um, acid, couldn't figure it out. Uh, so yes, here I'm showing you in green the inactivated coronavirus, meaning all the parts are there, but the RNA has been destroyed so it cannot make copies of itself. It's dead. And again, just want to reiterate that it cannot make copies. Okay, so on to the second point. There is also going to be not one but two adjuvants. So alum is part preservative, part adjuvant. It does irritate the immune system which is sadly necessary for a robust immune response. The third one, I've actually used this and ordered this in lab before, and it was very interesting to see it here. CPG is an adjuvant that I haven't seen before, but together, alum and CPG are the danger signal for the immune system. Now, CPG is actually from bacteria. It is bacterial DNA. And what's cool is that your immune system is so smart that it can tell the difference between your DNA, viral DNA, and bacterial DNA. Now I'm gonna draw for you an immune cell like a macrophage. So the only cells that are gonna be able to pick up a whole inactivated coronavirus vaccine are going to be immune cells like macrophages or dendritic cells. Macrophage literally means large eater and it, one of their number one jobs is to pick things up through a process of cell eating called phagocytosis and then break them down inside in an acidified chamber that's very similar to our stomach called a lysosome. Then they take a tiny piece of that and they put it on their surface and then they basically traffic as fast as they can to one of your lymph nodes. Your lymph nodes are located in spots typically around your neck, um, your armpits, behind your knees, uh, places that actually are moved, you know, when you exercise. Okay, so here is the inactivated coronavirus. Remember, it's dead. And there's also alum and CPG in the shot. And I'm going to show you why it's important. I'm just going to write here that it is bacterial DNA. And it's going to activate the immune system in a very important way. Okay, so the macrophage is going to eat what's in the shot. So there's a bit of alum, a bit of CPG, and a bit of the dead coronavirus. So here we go. Hopefully you can read that that is CPG. 
All right, so I mentioned it's going into the stomach portion of the cell called the lysosome. It's full of acid and other enzymes that act like scissors and cut things into tiny pieces. So now the CPG and the coronavirus have been cut into small green pieces and it's going to present it on the surface because this is how cells talk. They talk surface to surface on proteins called receptors. This one's called major histocompatibility complex two. All it means is it's where a macrophage talks to other immune cells. So if a T cell came along and tried to talk right now, it wouldn't work. The T cell would not become activated. Your immune system would not make a memory response. So this is where the TLRs come in. TLRs stand for toll-like receptors. They are one of the top danger signals that you can activate in your body. I'm drawing the receptors here in green, and I kind of ran out of space, so let's do it over here. The toll-like receptors, there's many of them. They're on the inside and the outside of your cell, but they bind to CPG. So this is basically telling your body there's a bacterial infection, even though it's a vaccine. It doesn't matter. What you need is signal one and signal two. Here we go. Signal two is the co-stimulatory molecule. It's a danger signal, so I draw it in red. Um, but yes, the combination of signal one and signal two, boom, here we go. You have activated a T cell, and the T cell is going to then activate a B cell and make you antibodies. All right, so here is the CD4 T cell that was activated by that macrophage that ate some of the vaccine injection. Now here the CD4 T cell is going to activate the B cell to whatever part of the whole coronavirus it ate. It could be the spike protein, it could be the in protein, it could be other small pieces. Um, so you will get a variety of antigens in a whole inactivated vaccine. Okay, so here I'm drawing for you some orange antibodies. The B cell is what makes the antibodies. They can be in your bloodstream, in your tissue, and every person makes a different amount of B cells, which makes a different amount of antibodies. And some people seem to be having an immune response for over a year. Some people's antibodies seem to be dropping off after about six months. So everyone's immune system has the same textbook background, but in reality, uh, people express different levels of antibodies and have unique aspects to their immune system. So one shot is helpful. You will make antibodies, but it's not as helpful as two shots. That's why the majority of the vaccines, except for J&J, &J, require two shots, because upon the second shot, you are going to activate more B cells. The B cell is going to live longer, which means you will have B cell memory. You'll also have T cell memory. But on top of that, you're gonna make more antibodies. So if for some reason somebody comes along and coughs on you, if you have just a super antibody in your nose, in your lungs, you are going to experience little to no symptoms. Whereas if you have few antibodies or no antibodies, the virus will be able to access your cells via the ACE2 receptor. All right, so I wanted to end on this chart that I put together because I couldn't give you the efficacy against the original coronavirus from Valneva. I'm not sure if the studies are set up slightly differently in the UK or in Europe, um, but I want to compare just briefly the different types of vaccines, adjuvants, etc. So you can see that Moderna and Pfizer are mRNA vaccines. They don't actually need adjuvants. They can activate the toll-like receptors on their own. And they do have lipid nanoparticles, no access to the DNA and nucleus, and a very high efficacy against the original coronavirus. Then you have the two adenovirus vectors, J&J &J and AstraZeneca. They also do not have an adjuvant. The fact that they're in a virus is enough to activate the danger signals, the toll-like receptors. They do not contain lipid nanoparticles. However, they do give access to the nucleus and DNA because adenovirus is a DNA virus. They're not able to replicate and they're not able to change your DNA, but they are able to enter the nucleus. Their efficacy um, really varied. It's around the 80 percentile range, especially against severe symptoms. Then there is an original, Novavax. It's just the spike protein, and it has an adjuvant because the spike protein alone will not activate the immune system sufficiently, 
and the types of cells used to grow the coronavirus is the moth. There are lipid nanoparticles and approximately a 90.4% efficacy. Then you have at the bottom the three whole inactivated virus choices. You have Valneva, Sinovac, and Covaxin. They're all using Vero cells. The adjuvants vary a little bit. There is alum and CPG DNA in Valneva to activate the immune system through toll like receptor 9. There's just alum and Sinovac. And then Covaxin has a newer adjuvant called Alhydroxyquim 2. It activates toll-like receptors 7 and 8, and they all use Vero cells. And none of them have lipid nanoparticles. None of them have access to the nucleus and DNA. Uh, there is no reported efficacy. The researchers, out of the 4,000 people in the phase 3 clinical trial, they reported how much antibody was produced and what targets the antibody was produced for. So in the high-dose group, 100% of people made high levels of antibodies against the spike protein, N protein, and about four or five other targets, which could be a good thing. However, there is no reported efficacy against Delta. Now, I do want to say here that efficacy against Delta, people are sometimes reporting the protection against either mild to moderate symptoms, and sometimes when you see it online, they're talking about protection against being hospitalized. So the numbers do vary quite a bit. It depends on whether or not we're looking at a population of people in a nursing home, population of people um, who are going to the hospital, or even some data being collected during the continuation of the clinical trials. So that's why the numbers are all over the place. But the take home message here is that the majority of people who are vaccinated are staying out of the hospital. All right, one last thing I want to mention, in case you were wondering, in the beginning when I mentioned immortalized cells, I was talking about the fact that they have stem cell-like qualities. And that is true. Um, the breaks are basically taken off of the cell. And if that reminds you of cancer, that's partially true. So something more like a benign tumor is more of a correct definition. The cells are able to replicate infinitely which can happen in your body. It does sometimes result in a tumor, but it could be removed through surgery. Now, there are no Vero cells in the shot, and the Vero cells cannot change your DNA. They cannot interact with your cells in any meaningful genetic way. I just wanted you to understand what immortalization was, and if you have any additional questions, please drop them in the comments. I have lots of links in the description box, and I've got two additional videos um, coming out. I won't be available next week, but afterwards I'll have a video on natural killer cells and APOE2. All right, thanks for sticking with me for 17 minutes, and stay healthy.